I'm Claudia Hammond and this is a download of All in the Mind, a programme originally broadcast on the 12th and 13th of May 2015 on BBC Radio 4. First today, the mental health condition where people are convinced they look so repulsive that they feel ashamed and self-conscious about their appearance. It can reach the point where they avoid all contact with other people and in some cases even attempt suicide. It's called body dysmorphic disorder and although the consequences can be devastating, the treatment is relatively straightforward but that's only if people realise what their problem is and can find a professional who understands what's wrong. We brought together Gareth Stevens, who was out of work for nine years because of the condition, with someone who's spent his career researching and treating body dysmorphic disorder, Professor David Veal, consultant psychiatrist at the South London and Maudsley NHS Trust. I began by asking Gareth what he thought the problem was with his appearance. Just that I was kind of freakishly ugly and that wherever I went, people would kind of ridicule me. You know, I guess I felt wherever I went that I was the kind of centre of attention that was a, a kind of spotlight following me almost, you know, and that everybody was kind of aware of me being there and, and was, you know, either laughing externally or internally about how horrible I looked. So what did you think was wrong? You know, anyone would say you were perfectly nice looking. So there was a range of different things, really. So my main kind of preoccupation initially was with the size of my nose, so I felt that it was hugely out of proportion to my face. But then I started to worry that my face was too thin and that I was too skinny in general. And then it got to a stage where I started to worry about the proportions of my body, so I felt that my head was too small for my body. And I'd take kind of pictures and videos of myself and scrutinise the proportions of things and then compare them to other people and so on. And presumably other people would say to you, but it's, it's not out of proportion and it's completely fine and what are you talking about and would you just not believe them? Yeah, like I said, I thought they were lying to me, which I guess may seem quite harsh, you know, because some of these people cared about me and I cared about them, you know. But I guess that just kind of highlights that, that it is a, a delusion almost. But you kind of firmly convinced that they know the truth as do you which is that you you look um, hideous and david veal you've been treating body dysmorphic disorder for a long time how common is it well it's surprisingly common it's about one to two percent of the community so it's you know just as common more common than things like schizophrenia and anorexia that seems surprising that it's more common than those when we don't hear about it very much. Well, it's very much under-recognised, and it's something even when individuals present to mental health professionals, mental health professionals don't ask about it, and so it's something that's something very shameful for an individual with BDD to have, and they're more likely to seek help, perhaps, from a cosmetic practitioner or a dermatologist, or they may just avoid things and be very housebound. And, it, and as David says, it's really quite disabling, you know, I think... Because you're worried so much about what other people are going to think of you. Other people become a phobic object, so you try and avoid them at all costs, you know. So if you think about the impact that would have on your life, you're trying to avoid people every day. So um, would you stay in most of the time? Yeah, definitely. I used to avoid doing most things. I think the most I would do really would be go to the shop kind of once a week, which would be the supermarket. Again, it'd be a really kind of traumatic experience because the lights in there are very bright, so and there's nowhere to hide really, particularly at the checkouts when you stood there waiting in the line and everybody stood there so everybody looks around, you know. And you'd think they were looking at you? Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, that's the most I would really do kind of once a week. And I remember... I think maybe kind of once or twice a year I'd go into the town centre if I really had to, so if I had like an optician's appointment or something. But even then I'd kind of plan it out beforehand, you know, and I'd, I'd find a car park that was as close to where I was going as possible and I'd plan a route that would involve seeing as few people as possible and all the way there I'd just kind of keep my head down, I'd be staring at the floor to make sure, you know, to try and stop people from looking at me. And it got to the stage where you, where you couldn't work, as you say, so yeah. what your fear about going to work was just that everyone would would think bad things about you and about your appearance. Yeah, definitely. So on a day-to-day -day basis, so initially I, I remember kind of feeling more inhibited um, just in general at work, you know, and I'd try and choose a desk where I'd be sat with my back to other people and so on. But then the difficult points of the day would be when I had to get up from my desk and kind of walk through the office, you know, and then I'd feel that I was really kind of on show. So then I'd kind of avoid, you know, getting up to use the toilet and things, but then... Obviously, that makes you feel more anxious when you have those kind of sensations and so on. So, so David, how typical is the kind of experience that Gareth describes? Very typical. And, of course, as someone like Gareth would get more and more withdrawn and ruminating more, and then they get more depressed, and they may begin to seek out sort of alternative solutions and spend their time on the Internet looking for the right solution. And then, you know, when it gets very bad, they're obviously very suicidal. So there's a high suicide rate in this condition. And... 
this is the big issue, really. I think it's, it's much more so than just ordinary depression. And presumably people don't usually recognise for themselves that what they've got is this condition, because what they think is that they're unacceptably ugly or unattractive. And that's the biggest problem, because, you know, th- th- this is a treatable condition. It's definitely difficult to treat, but the biggest problem is trying to help engage the individual and in recognising that this is a, a body image problem, an emotional problem that is treatable. That you, you know, you can do things in a different way. Gareth, what made you realise that it, it wasn't that you were ugly, it's that you had a problem? Um, it was actually seeing David on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a programme on the BBC called Too Ugly for Love. I think it was late 90s, early 2000s. It was lucky that I caught it, really. But I remember, you know, all of a sudden there were people who were describing things that I was feeling and other people talking about kind of solutions to those problems, really. So it was, it was a revelation because at this time I'd been seeing a psychologist locally for, oh, I don't know, maybe a year, 18 months, and she hadn't mentioned body dysmorphia at any point. So to finally kind of, you know, hear that other people were going through the same thing, that it had a name, you know, and that, that it was a condition, there was a treatment, it was, was a, a real revelation, like I say. And so you had cognitive behavioural therapy. Well, what did that consist yeah. of? What did you have to do? So I, I guess there's two components to it. So one is kind of starting to face the situations that you've been avoiding, and then the other component is kind of challenging your thoughts in that situation, I guess. Um, so those are the big things that stand out to me. David may feel there's other important well, I, elements. I think I mean, it's not always necessary changing thoughts because, of course, these thoughts are very difficult to change. They're very rigid and... Convinced. Yeah, so it's no good you just saying, oh, exactly. well, you're not ugly at all. So we tend yeah. to focus more on what we call the processes, particularly things like the sort of being very self-focused, the things, the process of ruminating, the process of comparing, and the very self-criticism all the time. These are the things that we have to try and look at to see whether, in fact, these things are helpful or whether they're actually maintaining the problem, making you more depressed and more preoccupied, and trying to unpick those. And did you have to do practical things? So the types of things that I would find difficult would be initially anything where there were other people. So at first it was just kind of walking down the street at busy times and so on. But then it was starting to go into situations where escape would be a little more difficult. So kind of sitting in cafes and so on, having a cup of coffee, where there would be a lot of people, you know, and people, I'd have to sit and face other people and so on. And that must have been hard for you. Yeah, it's brutally hard, really, really hard. But I think... You know, it was certainly worth it. I think within kind of six to eight weeks of having that treatment, things had radically changed. You know, my view of the world had changed completely. That seems such a short time after all the years that you'd had this. Yeah, yeah, it was. And can you remember noticing how things had changed for you? Yeah, there was a particular, what they call a behavioural experiment that I was doing as part of the treatment, which was to go and sit in a cafe with a cup of coffee and a piece of cake. And I remember being sat there and... I think this was like the fourth or fifth time I'd done it, and up until that point I'd found it really, really difficult. But all of a sudden, I kind of thought, this is great. Like Up until that point, I believed that the only reason that people went to cafes was because they thought that's what people should do. I didn't believe that people could actually enjoy it. You know, I think my brain had tried to rationalise my own kind of avoidance of the situation. So yeah, on this particular day, I, I remember thinking, this is brilliant. You know, and I was sat in nice surroundings, I had a nice piece of cake, I was enjoying my cup of coffee. And I finally started to kind of understand what other people got out of life almost, you know, because up until that point, you know, to me, the world had just been a very kind of threatening place. So, yeah, so that was a, quite a breakthrough moment, really. So, David, for cognitive behavioural therapy to work for this condition, does it have to be done in a specific way or will general cognitive behavioural no, therapy that's not, quite widely available work? It's not generic CBT. We've done the trials. We think you should follow the treatment protocols and you're much more likely to be successful that way. And I should also say, you know, for some people, the medication can also be helpful. The uh, SSRIs are things that are normally used for obsessive compulsive disorder in higher doses. And so some people combine it with that, and that's often helpful as well. But how easy is it to get specialist help? It's tough. And I think part of the problem, of course, is, as you, you've heard, is that individuals with BDD don't seek help. And when they do, that they may not talk about the main problem. And when they do finally come out with it, they may not get the right help. And so, you know, for some people, it's sort of 10 to 15 years before actually getting the right help. And there are specialist clinics around. And, you know, we, we want to get the word out, be able to train people more up and, you know, the, to this, uh, get the word across that you're not alone, that this is a treatable condition and there's a community out there willing to help. He was talking about the difficulty in accessing treatment. And, of course, part of the problem with that is not only do you feel ashamed of the way you look, you know, but... Because the doctor, because people are a phobic object, just going for that appointment is a huge, huge thing. And, and as you said, if people, 
if the medical professional doesn't know a lot about body dysmorphia and doesn't ask you about it, then that can feel like the end of the road to a lot of people, you know. It'd be very, very hard after that, I imagine, to then present for treatment again. Yes, you're um, relying on professionals to recognise yeah, the Yeah, absolutely, and it's a really important, important thing. Gareth Stevens and David Veal. And on Saturday, May 30th, there's a conference in London for people with body dysmorphic disorder and their friends and family. You'll find a link to that on the page for today's All in the Mind on the Radio 4 website. Now, Catherine, of course, a condition like this is going to have very complex causes, but... It just seems intriguing that one person's perception can be so different from another's, that one person can look in the mirror and see one thing, other people see something completely different. Yeah, I think the way that we um, form a mental representation of our body is quite complex. There's lots of information that feeds in. There's our sense of touch and there's information that comes from within our body. There's also photos that we see, what we see of ourselves in the mirror. And there's what people say and what our expectations are. And, And all of those things feed into us building a mental representation of what we do look like and what we should look like so I think it's not surprising that occasionally that's going to go wrong. Are there other ways in which perceptions about the body can get distorted? Yeah I think th- there's quite a few I mean eating disorders is is one example where that happens I guess and there are various neurological conditions. I think one that's particularly intrigued me is Alice in Wonderland syndrome and it's a kind of a temporary situation where people sort of look at their hands or look at their body and they seem their body parts suddenly seem really small compared to how they feel they should be or and then they'll suddenly seem really big again and they sort of seem to flip between being very small and very big and sometimes it can be just looking at your thumb and that happens so does it look small or does it feel small it's like what you see doesn't match what you feel and so you have this sense that you look at your thumb and it suddenly feels tiny and then it suddenly feels big, really too big. It's a, a strange sensation. But What's this happened to you then? I've had, I had it as a child and I've occasionally had it. I have migraines and what they found is that it, it happens quite often in children but they tend to grow out of it. But people who are prone to migraines will tend to have it sometimes as part of the aura or sometimes if the people have a, a high fever or a high temperature. And actually, when I've talked about this in lectures, I've nearly always found people saying, oh, that's what that is. I always wondered what that feeling was. I thought I was strange. And do they know what's going on neurologically? What, why does this happen? No one quite understands it, but it's a change in blood flow to the parts of the brain that essentially interpret body perception. So it's almost as if that, that mapping of the bits of your body breaks down for some reason, yeah. but, but just very temporarily. Exactly, and there's this mismatch, which is I think underlies so many of these different conditions, a mismatch between one source of information and another to the brain. Thanks very much, Catherine, and do stay with us. Now-